Thank you. Okay, so before I get started, I want to set a little bit of context so that um, we're not looking at this from one perspective and I'm talking about it from a completely different perspective. So when we look at how to go faster, first, I'm talking about digital channel delivery in this talk. So I know there's lots of reasons and lots of ways that we can deliver the stack. I want to make sure that we're looking at this and saying that digital channel delivery does require acceleration. So we're talking about the digital stack. And the other thing to think about is scale, right? If you are trying to solve a scale problem, it's a very different thing than trying to solve building one-offs. So Henry Ford solved a very different problem than the original auto manufacturers were solving, and Tesla saw that in Technicolor, right, when they built this really cool car, but then taking it to mass manufacturing was a completely different solve, uh, problem to solve. So what I'm trying to help you understand today is how do we go about solving channel delivery at scale? How do we go faster to meet the demands of the market? So I got four points I'm gonna to try to cover here. Why do we need to go fast? And I was hoping that was gonna be a little bit of a hypothetical, everybody agrees we need to go fast. Uh, common challenges that we face, how to create speed, and then some of the obstacles. So 25 minutes is tight, so I'm gonna talk fast and cover a lot of stuff. So why do we need to go fast? Industrial revolution, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, AI. IOT, biotech, all of these things are, ca are causing things to happen at an accelerated pace and the crazy thing that's going on is we're seeing innovation happen at a breadth that we've never seen in history. And it's happening at such a pervasive layer. It's impacting our lives, not just everybody's life, but it's impacting everybody's life in a very, very pervasive way. So it's changing absolutely everything and the thing about it is it's accelerating and, and that is absolutely unfathomable that we would be going faster than we've already been going over the last 10 years and we are. So this is, a, this is an interesting quote that I like to think about and this is kind of building on the story is a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that works. So when we look at the Industrial Revolution and you look at the things that took place, there's a lot of technologies that the people building the next set of technologies were building upon. And there was an encapsulation of those technologies which allowed them to take them, move forward without having to break them down. So we can build computing without having to understand CPUs at a deep layer. We just need to understand how much power, how much input, output, what does that look like from the interface perspective, right? So when you look at the digital challenge that we have today, this is a pretty recent look at what CEOs are struggling with in companies and the most urgent problems they're trying to solve right now are market demand, sales effectiveness, attracting talent, seems to be everybody's major concern in the tech industry, and partner and channel strategies, and all of those are very digital concerns, right? So the major concerns in most companies in the US are digital. They're trying to solve digital problems. And there's a common thread here. Enterprise integrations are needed to solve all of these problems. You cannot solve them without doing some kind of integration into the enterprise and pulling data out of the enterprise to drive those business processes. So now onto the problem. This is the problem that we're seeing. As we go out and talk to companies all across the country, this is what we're seeing and it's a resounding simplification of what we hear over and over again. I can't get data fast enough. It takes too long to create new capabilities in my organization. And anecdotally, it's, we hear things from it takes three months to it takes six to nine months. And it's all of those things that you guys are aware of. It's my team's already allocated, funding cycles are out of, out of whack with what we're trying to do. Um, it takes governance processes that are making things take a little bit longer. I have to go through multiple teams to get this done and the teams are already focused on other things. So those are all the challenges that they face. And then it takes too long to consume these capabilities because they really weren't put out there for self-service consumption. They were put out there in a way that requires tightly coupled connectivity to an expert in order to consume it and that guy is not sitting still at a call center with a headset on waiting for you to call and explain to him how that interface works. So there's a project manager and meetings get set up and all of those things and our customers tell us that that takes somewhere between two and three months and costs somewhere between 30 and $90,000 to create a net new interface into those capabilities inside of a company. So what is the cost of delay other than those costs 
So delays cost, right? Everybody understands this. It's an economic principle. We look at it and go, well, it's not that big of a deal. Well, the reality is everything that you take to market later costs. There's a cost of opportunity and there's a cost of relevancy of that particular technology in the marketplace. So when you look at it, you go, the easy thing to understand is that below the line red section that says, when you go to market later, your development costs are higher, therefore your cost is greater. When you start looking at these models, what you see is if you're building something that's net new innovation that nobody's ever done, and when you spring it on the marketplace, that its lifespan is going to be the lifespan that it's got, right? So the whole lifespan moves if you move your innovation later into the marketplace. So you're really not losing any performance or opportunity in the marketplace. The timeline shifted, but that's not very realistic. Not many of us are going out there and participating in forging new ground and creating new markets. We're, we're participating in existing markets that are thriving. So now we get into other models like a developing market that's growing for the very first time. If you enter that market late, it still has a fixed timeline, right? There's a lifespan of that technology. And when you enter later, it's not been waiting for you. It's already moved forward. So you have an opportunity window that you lost. And when we get to a typical model, there's another aspect of it that says not only did you lose some time in the market to get that money back, you also lost some of your opportunity. Some of those customers that you once were going to uh, acquire to, to use this technology or gain this benefit of performance are now moved on. And then the high cost of switching model. So if you're in one of those things like uh, really like b banking, right? So you build this banking tech and it takes a lot to get somebody onboarded to it and you're four months late to the market. If you missed a bunch of customers, not only did you miss them, but you do not have an opportunity to win them back. It's gonna take too much for them to do it and there's no return on investment for the consumer. So you completely lost out on that market opportunity. So that's your highest cost. But the, the picture here is every delay in getting to market costs us and sometimes costs us tremendously. So how do we get to market faster? This is really profound stuff. We must develop expected interfaces, and that's a really important word in there, expected interfaces, and reduce invention and creation. Because if we have to create net new things every time we go to market, that takes a long time, and it elevates risk, and it creates a lot of complexity, it takes a long time. So if we wanna move fast, we have to be able to create expected interfaces and reduce invention and creation. So I'm gonna cover these two things from the two perspectives that we talked about, right? The two challenges that companies face. How do we create faster, and how do we consume faster? And I'm gonna talk about the different things that you need to do in each one of those areas. So the cool thing about this presentation is that it's kind of in line with a lot of things that you've been hearing and the good news is when you hear other people saying it, you know there's this relevance in the marketplace of the things that are being said. So uh, Augusta and Matt's uh, conversations tie right in to what I'm talking about. So the first one is the API layer, right? APIM is evolving. Um, it's really relevant, but it's evolving, and um, it's going to be more than API. I think it's going to evolve to, to uh, Augusto's perspective. It's gonna evolve beyond API, just what we think of as the RESTful API world. It's gonna go well beyond that. But the value proposition that's being created by that layer is not going to go away. As a matter of fact, that value proposition is essential. It creates abstraction, and this particular abstraction is a really critical abstraction. This is the abstraction that takes your consumers and abstracts them away from your creators. That, let, me, let that sink in for a minute. So if your SDLC, your de development process, includes your consumers participating in creation, you cannot move fast. How do you create 10 consumers that are interfacing with a development team? How do you create 500 consumers that are interfacing with the development team? You can't. So when you segregate those concerns so that I can do creation at speed and I can do consumption at speed and they're no longer dependent on one another, they're independent, that is huge power. And that is an essential part of the power that organizations need today to be fast. Architecture. Some of this is really obvious stuff and others were saying the same things, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna express this as, Elastic code execution. So rather than talking about 
any type of specific containerization or those things, what you're really looking for is not having to own the entire stack and all of the things that you're doing in order to manage runtime, but just participating in something. So whether it's something your company owns, which Matt stated is a high bar, to build microservices, and a lot of companies went out there and tried to own the whole stack because they believe they have to do it on-prem, and they tried to build all of these things out, and they found out that's really difficult to do. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of new governance. There's a lot of new management. There's a lot of new tech stack. So that's tough stuff. But there are a lot of solutions out there in the cloud that you can use that are ready environments for you to do those types of things and participate in platform-based Kubernetes where you can drop containers into the cloud and use those in a ready fashion. Cache, so we think about cache from, uh, you know, an edge cache, you know, request response cache, absolutely important, but also the idea of caching data, not in the data management system, in the command center, or, but in the query sense of cache. Moving data out so that it can be performed and queried at speed. And that does create acceleration because it creates the ability to build data that looks like consumers want it to look like, right? So instead of having to worry about altering systems, we cache that data, make it look like what the consumer wants it to look like and present it quickly. Define, uh, software-defined networking, this is, kind of a, this is kind of a fringe one, but this is one of those things that where you look at it and you go, when I'm trying to move fast and I'm trying to requisition things and I can go out there and I can build this cloud technology, the next big obstacle that we see out there with companies is how do I get it connected? I now have to go through firewalls, I have to go through CDNs, I have to go through appliances, and I have to go through proxies and all these different things in the network, and it takes a week or two weeks or a month to get certificates issued and get connectivity to these things built. This solves that problem by giving you the ability to do that in a self-service fashion. Go fast. Patterns, facade pattern. So uh, Matt talked about um, BFFs. BFFs are a type of facade. It's a, not a best, Friends forever, but that's a good thing. Best friends forever is a good thing. Uh, but backends for front ends are solutions where you build an API that's really for that ex particular experience, but a facade more generally is just creating an experience that sits on top of the providing systems to present a different view. And the reason facades create acceleration is it gives us the ability to evolve faster than the core systems that we're drawing the information from. So if it's gonna take us six months to evolve and build technology out of our SAP system or out of our mainframe system, we can build a facade very quickly. And if we've got an Elastic Cloud implementation built for us, then we can do it even faster, right? So these technologies and these patterns allow us to move quick. CQRS is another one. A lot of folks have this aversion to separating your command and your query, but separating command and query is really relevant in a digital world because the way that we query data is very different than how we manage the data in the original data store and the source of record. And the volume that we query at is exponentially higher, so this becomes a really great pattern for separating how you query from how you command data at its source. PubSub, everybody gets that, but the big thing there is when I'm going and subscribing things that are event-driven, that needs to be a self-service type process that I can subscribe to. The data, the events, the way that those are happening, I don't have to work through an organization to get to it. I can subscribe to it on my own. And microservices, which you guys get all of that. <clears throat> the last aspect I wanna cover that's really important is this concept of ready. It's as a service. So APIM as a service. API portal as a service. API DevOps as a service. API platform as a service. Infrastructure as a service. And when I say that, I'm not talking about going to your organization that currently manages that and telling them to put a form up that allows people to requisition it. It's a change in mentality. It's looking at that the way that you would look at any type of a product and say, how do I create value by allowing development teams to build things quick by requisitioning all of the components that they need at speed? I think that one of the manifestations that I saw of this, it's wicked cool, was somebody using a Slack channel and a Slack bot to be able to create a new API that created a new microservice container. It created the GitHub repository, it created the stubbed API, it launched the whole thing, it put a hello world inside of it and it put it into a dev environment and it launched it to a QA environment. 
And now the team starts with a product that's QAable. And they can now start writing their test cases and start building out their code within this given structure because all of the things that were done up to that point were not valuable. It was just activity. So the team may have had a different opinion about how to do that, but there was really no value in doing it differently than it was done for them. So we're removing all of those unnecessary decisions, accelerating delivery. So as a service is a really critical step to accelerating delivery, and this can shave months off of your development. So these are some of the ideas. There's a lot more to think about here, but this is some of the things that we look at. These are the most common things that we look at and say, when you're creating APIs, these are the things that allow you to move faster. And then the other side of it, accelerating consumption. Jobs to be done. Clay Christensen, that perspective, right? It's the empathetic perspective. It's the um, design thinking perspective that when we look at things and go, we really want to create products that work in the marketplace. And in order to do that, we really have to understand what problem is my customer trying to solve? Because I want to help them solve their problem. I don't want to tell them how to solve their problem with what I've got. So that's the big challenge, right? And in order to do that, we have to be empathetic. It's not, oh, I understand what problem you're trying to solve. Let me show you how you do that with my tool set, right? We have to be empathetic and say, is that easy for them to do? I was working with a company that does auto um, service, right, technology. And they were showing me the APIs that they had created, and it was the same APIs that they used for driving their own portal. And when you looked at all of the different rules you had to follow in order to create a, uh, a scheduled appointment, you had to make something like 12 or 13 API calls. So we looked at the process and said, wait a minute, you really only need to make three API calls. It's what vehicle am I using? What appointment times are available? And then I should be able to put all the rest of that data into a single API call and push it to you. And then you should manage the complexity in the orchestration. Encapsulate complexity. When you have reuse, right? Only when you have, if you've got one, right, one consumer, encapsulating complexity is unnecessary. You're gonna create an interface that's going to create more time to consume and build than it is the value you get from it. But when you've got 40, 50, 150 people using this, 1,000 people using this, encapsulate your complexity. Take the complexity of your processes and hide those behind the scene. Create very simple, clear, easy to use APIs that solve the problems that the API consumers are trying to solve. Those consumers are not just outside your company, it's inside your company. And when you've got thousands of developers inside your company, you've got that exact same problem that you've got with people outside your company because they do not know all of your business systems and your tribal language. And a lot of these folks in IT have only been with your company a month or two. So being able to create self-evident consumption for internal folks is just as valuable as external folks. Create products. Create products that collect things together and make sense so that when somebody's searching for it, it makes sense. Create them based on teams that are evolving it to bring value to the marketplace and they don't have to wait for a new project to be spawned. But when a consumer says, hey, if you did this, it would provide this value to me, and the product owner or product manager of that particular API says, that's fantastic, we can do that. That's gonna provide a lot of value to our company and a lot of value to you. They put it into their next sprint and it's released the next week and the company gains value. So we're now putting the right changes into the system at the right time by looking at these things, and managing them as a product, and then measuring them for value based on consumer and company value. Self-service again, right? Measure that. Uh, API portals, they're websites. We've been doing websites for 25 years. You've got all of the same principles at play here. You've got the ability to look at what does the funnel look like? Are people acquiring? Are they finishing? Um, can, I, can I find out where they're getting stuck? Where are they bouncing and dropping out? How do I create a better experience for consumption? That's the concern of an API portal. It's not just a directory where you go find what's there. It's a place where you enable self-service consumption, and when you do that, you free up really valuable technical resources inside your organization to do what they need to do creating new things and not spend time with consumers consuming existing things. And then communications. So how does communications help things go faster? 
couple of perspectives. People build things that already exist because they didn't know that your thing exists. So by allowing the organization to know, hey, we built this thing, it's cool. We're gonna build these new things in the next six months. I want you to know that so that if you're thinking about building something like that or if you need to use it, it's available for you. And the other aspect of it is managing that team's questions, right? In a very, very convenient way. Post a question, the team's gonna answer the question and it creates a nice way for the consumer of the APIs to ask questions and have a dialogue with the development team. So that's how we accelerate the consumption of APIs, self-service. So when you look at that picture, you go, this is kind of what success would look like if I had to create a new API, is we, we get a request and we start with our design first and somebody requests a new API capability, we create an OAS definition that represents it or SwaggerDef and we go out there and show it to the customer, they go, wow, that's amazing, that's exactly what we're looking for. In a day or two, we have a prototype built inside of the API platform. The customer starts using the contract, they go, this is fantastic, we love it. We spend about a week and a half to two weeks building a minimally viable representation of that for the customer, launch that, put it into production, they go into the portal, requisition a production key, and bam, they're live. Two weeks, three weeks, not 10 months, not five months, three weeks. And when you start looking at the cost of delay, these are the experiences that you wanna be creating inside of your company. And if you were not building a net new, but you have a DevOps and a dedicated team and you're managing this like a product, then like I said, it could be just a couple of days for them to add that into their backlog, put it into the next sprint, launch it, and this could be done in a few days, just three or four days. Or better yet, the capability that you're looking for, it's already in the developer portal. Because you built this based on your company's capabilities, not systems, not processes. Systems change, processes change, technology stacks change. Capabilities that your company has do not change rapidly. If you deliver packages, you still deliver packages. The data that you use for managing and tracking the packages has evolved and added to over the years, but the base data that you were gathering hasn't changed. If you sell automobiles, if you deliver technology, it's the same thing. Your base technologies, your capabilities as a company and your value in the marketplace, it is not adopting or evolving rapidly. It's just added to, little by little. So largest challenges that your organization is gonna face in going faster and making these changes are the presets of how your organization behaves. So it's things like organization, how I organize people. Can I put teams together that are multifunctional teams that get to live all year long doing one thing? Process, security, governance, and trust. Trust, the biggest part of that is moving at speed. Safety at speed requires a whole lot of trust and a great process to manage that. And then behavior and adoption. How are you being really intentional about moving people from where they're at to where you want them to be? Because that's the biggest challenge that you're gonna face is how do we really influence people? How do we express the value? How do we give them a path? How do we make it believable? How do we make it attainable? How do we show them how to move from A to B and get them over there, right? Not just build it and go, we built this new thing and it's cool, you should use it. And that is my talk. Ooh, thank you, Luke. Questions? So there's room for questions, of there's course. There's room for questions, yes. Questioners. Raise your arms. <laughs> now. No questions? No questions. All right. Well, but you'll oh, find you. Over there? Ah, that's a question. Thank you for the question. So my question is when you define an API, how do you know that you have a good API, a good quality API, and you say, okay, I, I'm freezing this. I'm freezing this, yikes. I, and, and releasing it. <laughs> okay, freezing it and releasing it. So that's what product teams do, right? A product team has a product owner, a product manager, and their job is to understand where is value come from, right? So we look at it and go, when a consumer uses this, the consumer sees it as valuable, but is it valuable to my company? Because if it's valuable to a consumer and not valuable to my company, then it's not good. 
but if it's valuable to the consumer and valuable to the company, it's very good. So you look at that use case and you say, what's the minimal I can put out there to get the highest value for our company? We put that into a sprint and we release it. So when you're talking about locking down the API, I assume that's what you're meaning is locking the sprint so that you can move forward with releasing something to production. So yeah, that's, that's the idea. Other questions? Nope. Well, thank you very much for your time. I will be around in the, uh, in the pavilion over there right after the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Lou.